Good morning. It's good to see you all here. We are in Judges 16, and we're wrapping up this section in regards to Samson. And it's really been tragic, quite frankly, and, and, and a tough go of it. Um, but I want to start with something else, with, with just a, a word picture, if you will. It was Saturday, June 1st, 2019, Madison Square Garden. World heavyweight champion Anthony Joshua stepped into the ring against a man he wasn't supposed to fight. A last-minute entry to cover for the original opponent who failed several drug tests. Uh, Joshua was undefeated. He stood six foot six. He weighed over 240 pounds. All the pundits predicted an easy victory by knockout in the early rounds. The man he faced that night was one Andy Ruiz Jr. from Southern California. Although an accomplished professional boxer in his own right, no one gave him a chance. Andy was much shorter, much heavier than the champion. And he looked slow. He looked out of shape. He only had, I think, a few weeks to uh, train. Uh, boxing analyst Brian Graham described the fight. Here it is, and it's a, long, it's a lengthy couple of quotes. Here it is. Joshua's physical advantages in height, four inches, and reach, eight inches, appeared even more ominous under the glare of the garden lights as the chiseled six-foot-six, 247 a pound champion. Now, here's the thing. I, I can do 247. I've never done two, six foot six. That would be cool, right? But it's just uh, in any case, he spent the opening round fighting off the back foot while the challenger moved forward in pursuit. The 2012 Olympic gold medalist who emerged as one of boxing's biggest superstars during a run of sold-out stadium shows in the UK continued to measure distance into the second, scoring an occasional spots as Ruiz struggled to negotiate his way around the jab. The widely preordained outcome appeared imminent in the third when Joshua sent Ruiz, Ruiz's doughy 6'2", 268 frame to the deck with a left hook to the temple early in the round. In other words, everyone thought, okay, this is it. He's done. Once he gets up, he'll finish him off. It's over. Graham continues, Ruiz comfortably beat the count. Refused to clinch when Joshua closed in for the finish. Then connected with the right hand over the top amid a firefight in the center of the ring that sent the champion to the canvas against the run of play. Joshua made it to his feet, but Ruiz resumed the chase around the ring, battering the champion backward towards his own corner with a series of uncontested punches. Then near the end of the third, Ruiz connected with a heat-seeking right that knocked Joshua down and partially threw the ropes, only for the champion to will himself upright on sheer instinct before getting saved by the bell. Long story short, near the end of the seventh round, the referee had to stop the fight. Ruiz continuously closed the gap and dropped the champion to the canvas two more times. With a little over a minute left in the round, the unheralded Ruiz had pulled off one of the biggest upsets in boxing history. He was declared the new undisputed heavyweight champion of the world at the end of that round. The Bible itself is replete with such accounts. Men and women of varying degrees, degrees of faith overcoming insurmountable odds. Noah builds an ark in the desert. Abram follows God into a strange land. Moses leads his people out of 400 years of bondage. Esther saves her people from genocide. Ruth finds salvation in her kinsman redeemer. There's something here worthy of your attention. None of these men and women are remarkable in and of themselves. They often displayed little or no discernment. They continuously questioned and even doubted God at every hard turn. Along their respective journeys of faith, they all sinned. Much like all of us here, they are nothing. And they accomplish nothing without the power of God working in and through them, achieving His will for His glory. It reminds me of something the Apostle Paul once said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 through 10. There it tells us, each time he, meaning God, said, my gracious favor is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may work through me. Since I know it is all for Christ's good, I am quite content with my weaknesses, with insults, with hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then 
I am strong. You see, your weakness, admitting your weakness, acknowledging that, and even being comfortable and embracing them, it opens your eyes to your reliance on God and His infinite power. In fact, it is the doorway to having the power of God that all of us desire. It's counterintuitive, right? Now then, last time we were in Judges, we looked at how the mighty had fallen. Due to Samson's sinful impulses and hubris, God the Holy Spirit had left him. He didn't even know it, but God was gone. Get this, when you are at your lowest and weakest point, that is when God's power is finally within your reach. Make sure you get that. When you are at your very lowest and weakest point, when you have exhausted all of your wisdom, all of your physical strength, all of your financial resources, when you are nothing and you feel that it's coming to an end, that's when you have the opportunity to finally acknowledge, God, I am nothing without you. I need you. That's when the doors to his power are open. No one knew this truth better than Samson. Blinded and bound by his enemies, he is the epitome of weakness. And as a result, at long last, God's power is about to be unleashed in and through him. And so this morning, we're going to look at three ways how God always wins. God had chosen Samson as his own. He had called Samson to fulfill his purposes, which was to begin to save Israel from the Philistines. So make no mistake, God has chosen you in a same similar manner. He's chosen you to be his son, to be his daughter. You were bought with a price by the sinless blood of Jesus Christ. And as such, God has called you to something far greater than yourself. He's called you, he's gifted you to fulfill his unique plans and purposes for your life, and for those around you. Now, I'm not going to pretend to know the specifics of what God intends to do in your situation, but I know this, as long as you acknowledge your weakness, as long as you acknowledge your dependence on Him, God will work in and through you by the power of His Holy Spirit to accomplish His will for His glory. He's going to do this in each and every one of your lives. And so that's our purpose this morning, to enable you to see your weakness and your utter dependence on the power of God. And by the way, this is essential, and I kind of go through this little mantra, and I've found myself doing it lately a lot, and and there's reason behind it, because it's so essential right now in our world and in our community, everything. And when we acknowledge this, I am nothing without you. I am absolutely weak and nothing makes sense. Nothing's going to work out without you, Father. That then opens up the door for his power, for your marriage, for your family, for your church, for your community, for the world. You see, you can be and make a difference. You will, you can, you you must. And this is the way to do it. Again, it's counterintuitive. It's not about you being the smartest, the strongest, the best looking, the richest in the room. That's not it. It's about you being humble and going, Father, I need you because I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go and live this kind of life in the context of marriage, family, community, work, church. And when you're humble like that, that's when his power is unleashed in and through you. Now you're living with a purpose, with a mission, and God's going to use you. So let's get to it as we look at these three ways God always wins. And I would also add to that through humble people. He always wins through the humble. Here's our first point. God always wins despite your lack of power. Despite your lack of power. Join me there in Judges 16, verses 21-22 to begin with. Look at what it says. And the Philistines seized him. They gouged out his eyes. They brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. 
So Samson's hair was gone, and so is God the Holy Spirit. He had left too. And this is the thing. That, that's his source of his power, his strength in the first place. Of course, initially, Samson wasn't aware of the Spirit's absence. Much like all of us, he assumed that he was just simply, I'm, I'm gifted, I'm strong, I'm, this is just who I am, able to accomplish incredible feats of strength like ripping a lion apart with his bare hands and killing a multitude of his enemies with a donkey's jawbone. Look, all of you here have strengths and weaknesses, right? Some of you are gifted in business. Others can build homes from the ground up. We have musicians, we have artists, teachers and preachers, and so much more. Understand this. God has given you a gift in these areas of your life empowering, enabling you to accomplish unique and great things in His name. But here's the thing. Some of you take this gift, His gift, for granted. You think it's all about you instead of Him. You believe it's the product of your hard work, of your natural abilities, and then you simply improving upon those. And that's not true. It's all of God or it's nothing. And so you think it's all about you instead of Him until until His Spirit departs and you're left completely broken, completely weak. This is exactly where we find Samson. Look at verse 21 again. And you'll see indications of how powerless he had become. Verse 21, and the Philistines seized him. Think about that just for a moment. When was the last time anyone, let alone a Philistine, laid hands on Samson? And the answer, biblically, is never. So this was a first for them and for Samson. Secondly, they gouged out his eyes. This is actually the most ironic indication of how powerless Samson had become. Because not only did they rob him of his physical sight, but These were the same eyes that he had once used to determine what was right and wrong for himself in his own eyes. They had been brutally gouged out. He was spiritually blind before, but now he knew it because his physical sight had been taken from him. Third indication. He has moved to where? Gaza. We all know what's going on in Gaza. So it's familiar to us. It's an ancient place. At the time, it was as far away from the people of Israel as the Philistines could possibly get. As far away uh, from any kind of help, any kind of rescue. There is no sense of powerlessness then uh, than being isolated and removed from the people whom you love and you believe love you. And that's where he's at. Fourth. He was bound in bronze shackles, no bowstrings this time, no new ropes. They were taking no chances. They wanted their hostage blind and immobilized. Lastly, he ground at the mill in the prison. And so now we see it. Samson is nothing more than a powerless slave. This is what sin can and will eventually do to you. And I know you're thinking... I've been living habitually in sin with no consequences for a long time. I think I'm good, Tim. I think I'm all right. No, there's there's two things there. If you are habitually living in unrepentant sin at this moment, for any extended period of time, one of two things is true. Either God loves you and is waiting for you to repent, Or God doesn't even know you and could care less. You're not his son. You're not his daughter. You're not his concern. Now, which one is it? Either way, what is the answer? Repent. Trust in Jesus Christ. Repent of that sin. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect once you do it. You're just like me. You're going to screw it up again. That's all right. You repent again. You confess again. You go back again because this is his unbelievable love. But don't you assume that you get to just, I'm I'm good. I get to live like this forever. This is exactly what Samson did. 
Where did sin lead him? Chained to a wall, blind, powerless, weak. We're going to read here in a moment. The only way he could get around was because a little kid, not an armed guard, a little boy could grab his hand and say, don't step in that. That's you. That's me. When we hold on to sin and think it's cool and think there's no consequences, you're either his son and he's going to discipline you and bring you back or you're not his son or daughter and he could care less. Go be blind. We are nothing but slaves to sin without the power of God in our lives. And for Samson, by the way, uh, this all happened overnight. Fittingly, as he slept, that's when they shaved him, that's when his power left him. And what this tells us is that some of us, spiritually speaking, are asleep while the enemy is busy cutting our hair, so to speak. Uh, how can you tell if you're spiritually asleep at the wheel and the power of God is on the verge of leaving you or already has and you're just not even aware of it? Here it is, and I think they're going to show up here. Signs of being spiritually asleep. There's four of them. Here's the first one. Your time in God's Word is superficial or non-existent. You're asleep. And I'm not talking about, because I know what we do. We like to keep score. Well, I'm here, aren't I? You know, that's enough. And uh, no, that's not it. Look, we're in a relationship. It's not a religion, right? And so I'm in a relationship with Stephanie Smouse Castillo. And if I didn't talk to her for three weeks straight, like some of us go, just barren in the desert, no prayer life, no communication with God. If I didn't talk to her for three weeks straight, you know, she wouldn't be counselor enough. We got to go get our own counselor and re, you know, establish because there's something wrong with our relationship, right? Absolutely. Your time in God's word is superficial, not existent. And as a result, by the way, what this does is immediately it, it depletes you of the ability to be discerning. Oh, this is right. This is wrong. And I need to choose what's right. It depletes you of your ability to have wisdom, to do what is wise in God's eyes. Because you're not reading his word. You're not hearing his voice and you're not being guided by his spirit as a result. Here's the second one. You rarely pray or your prayers are repetitive and ineffectual. And so I don't know what it causes you to pray. For some of us, it's like, I can't pay the bills. I better pray. I, for, you know, we, it's, it's basically a Hail Mary. You know, it's just when... Uh, circumstances require that we've exhausted everything else. Okay, now I'm going to pray. For others, we pray all the time, but they're ineffectual. They're just like, uh, yeah, thank you, God, for these, this food, and amen. You know, it's, we don't mean it. It's just words we've heard repeated, maybe at church, maybe somewhere else. And we repeat them without thinking, without really meaning it, without really putting our heart in it. And so it, it's not even prayer. It's just gibberish. What if you said the same thing over and over to everybody you know? They would think you're nuts, right? It's the same thing. It, it, it means you, you're really just asleep. You're, you're like sleepwalking, going through life, and like, hey, Bob, hey, Bob, hey, Bob, whatever. Uh, third one, church and fellowship are optional. Why? Because you're busy. You're busy doing what's right in your own eyes. Like that's, you know, I go whenever I feel like it. God requires something different. Lastly, you do not proclaim the gospel. And you don't seem concerned for the lost. Look, if you were fully spiritually awake, you would see the certainty of hell. You would rejoice in the glory of heaven and you would storm the gates of hell itself to tell the lost about their one and only hope, Jesus Christ crucified and risen for their eternal salvation. You would want to be able to look at them and say, sometime in eternity, I gave it my best shot. I was faithful. I warned you. I shared the love of Christ with you. But you don't care. Now look, this may be you. 
In fact, I dare say that all of us, including and most definitely myself, there are times we find ourselves spiritually asleep, and we have these indicators and many more besides. So here's the question. How do you snap out of your slumber? You step out of the darkness and into the light. We see this in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 14 through 17. Notice what it says there. And where your light shines, it will expose their evil deeds. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, all those things that we just listed. Rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So be careful how you live, not as fools, but as those who are wise, having the ability to discern what's right and wrong and choosing what's right in God's eyes, not our own. Make the most of every opportunity for doing good in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but try to understand what the Lord wants you to do. How do you do that? All the things we talked about. Read your word. Hear God's voice. Pray to Him. Be in communion with Him. Come to church and be encouraged. Be held accountable in a loving way. Go share the gospel boldly and faithfully. This is how you live thoughtfully in these evil times. Samson had done the exact opposite. And now he finds himself powerless. He was physically blind, but he was about, finally, he was about to see the light. And so what light did Samson need to see? He had to see that he was nothing without the power of God. As we're told in Judges 16.22, But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Now then, I know some of you feel powerless. You feel broken, helpless. Believe it or not, that's good. This is a good thing. God can work with that. Why do we know this? Because we see it everywhere in Scripture. If that's true then, it's true now. And so I know, because I, I, I experience it every day in my own life. I know there's areas in your life, not every bit of it, but there's areas in your life like, I have no control over that. I can't fix that. Even if I had inexhaustible amounts of wealth, I couldn't throw enough at it to make it right. This thing, this person, this whatever, I am powerless to cure. I am powerless to resolve. I am powerless to win. You have that in your life. This is a good thing. Because now, finally, at last, you can see the power of God in front of you. Now you can be humbled and acknowledge, God, I may have some things figured out. I have some strengths, and even those, I give you the credit. But this, I've got nothing. And so I'm humbled before you. Let me pray. Let me seek your face and your word. Find some answers for this. What should my attitude be? What course of action should I take? Now you're humble. Now you're right there at the verge. You're right there at the door for God to unleash his power. But it means leaning into your weakness first. Secondly, God always wins despite your enemy's appearances of power. Despite your enemy's appearance of power. Look at Judges 16, verses 23 through 25. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, Our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, Our God has given our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country, who has killed many of us. And when their hearts were merry, they said, Call Samson, that he may entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he entertained them. They made him stand between the pillars. All the trappings of external power are evident in the text. In the Philistines, yeah? And so it begins with the lords of the Philistines. These lords or governors are the same men that conspired with Delilah to capture, torture, and imprison Samson with impunity. No one dared challenge them. 
They were, if you will, a, a cabal with eminent or immense amounts of wealth, influence, and most notably, the kind of power a typical man or woman of normal means would never dare resist. By the way, I'm not sure if you've noticed or not, but in many ways, we are living in the shadow of a similar cabal. Uh, There's different names for it, I suppose. All of us fill it to a certain degree. Uh, One name for it is a deep state that will someday come out of the shadows, much like the Philistines, to openly celebrate what they believe is their well-earned and inevitable victory. So how did they celebrate the humiliation of God's chosen man? Look at verse 23. It tells us that they, they gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice, and they said, Our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hand. Uh, Dagon was known as the father of other lesser gods, such as Baal. And when they celebrated a victory, uh, they believed that Dagon had also defeated the god of their enemy. So it was, you know, a two-for-one deal in their minds. So it wasn't just, yay, we won. No, this was, uh, Dagon has vanquished Yahweh. That's what would have been on their minds. That would have been a part of their worship and celebration. Samson uh, couldn't see it, but he was well aware of what was happening. He knew his his enemies were celebrating his humiliation and that in their eyes, Dagon had defeated the Lord God. Now then, a, a little aside, and I'll preface it with this. I should really stop watching the news altogether by the way. Here's why. Because on every possible front imaginable, it seems like in our world, evil, godlessness, and sin-filled people and entities are winning. Am I right, or is it just me? You look at it, not all of them, mind you, but you look at uh, the majority of our own politicians It's like they are intentionally undermining the security and sanctity of our nation. Our education system, and let me preface this very quickly, I'm not talking about our teachers in the classrooms doing the hard and actual work of educating our children, many of whom are unruly in ways I could have never imagined, like in the 80s even. No, I'm not talking about them, men and women, that are dedicated to the art and discipline of education. No, I'm talking about, in many cases, their supervisors, those individuals that sit in offices all day and don't teach a soul, coming up with new ways to indoctrinate our sons and daughters. That so-called education system is determined to corrupt the youth of America, to sway them, to vote a particular way, to adapt a certain uh, kind of worldview. It sounds very familiar, right? This is exactly what the Philistines had done. They had exerted their influence on Israel to such a degree that you could not see the difference between the two people. These are the same people, the same ones in our education system, responsible for what we see happening currently in our university campuses. Instead of attending class, they are outside spewing racist, anti-Semitic slogans at the top of their woke, entitled lungs. And it's not complicated. This issue is not nuanced. There's no excuse for supporting a known terrorist group that has decapitated babies and committed sexual crimes, raped women, and yet they celebrate them publicly. It's as though we're right there with Samson. Our enemies are about to take a victory lap. And it seems as though they have all the power and we are hopeless. Where do you find the strength to carry on when it seems like the enemy has already won? Our third point, God always wins because God alone is all-powerful. Read with me Judges 16, 26 through 28. And Samson said to the young man who held him by the hand, Let me feel the pillars on which the house rests, that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women, 
All the lords of the Philistines were there. And on the roof there were about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson entertained. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me. Please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. Now the key to all that is found in in this is, is found in verse 28. Samson called to the Lord. The Hebrew word for called is kara. It means to cry out. In other words, he prayed. But it's not just that simple repetitive prayer. It's not that superficial prayer. And it's not even a Hail Mary, you know, this is my last, you know, resort kind of prayer. No, this is... Uh, My heart is broken. I am truly humbled. And only you, I acknowledge not only my weaknesses, but your unlimited power, God. I know who you are now through experiencing my own weakness. And I am crying out to you. It's that kind of prayer. Now make sure you get this. The power of prayer, it does not flow from us. It's not about repeating special words. The power of prayer is not based on the direction you face or the position of your body. The power of prayer does not come from the use of religious religious artifacts or icons, candles or beads or any other such thing. The power of prayer comes from the omnipotent one who hears our prayers and answers our prayers according to his will. Samson, blind, feeble, chained between two pillars, absolutely powerless. But he prayed to the Lord. And by the way, the Lord here in this instance, it's Adonai Yahweh, meaning the Lord God is sovereign. He is all power. He accomplishes anything he chooses to. This is something that I believe you and I have to really get into our heads and into our hearts. God is sovereign over all. Look, this isn't a Calvinist versus Arminian thing that I'm trying to preach to you here. It's just Bible. And so if you don't know what those two terms mean, that's okay. Don't worry about it then. That's not what's important. What is important is what the Bible says. And what I find is that God is sovereign. He's in control. And he has all the... There is, there's nothing of his created order that limits the exercise of his power, including and especially you. And Samson even gets it. Adonai Yahweh. Lord, you are sovereign. And so he says it there in his prayer, O Lord God, Adonai Yahweh, Lord God who is sovereign, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may be avenged of the Philistines from my two eyes. And then we see it, verse 29. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. Then his brothers and all his family came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtol, in the uh, tomb of Manoah, his father. He had judged Israel 20 years. Look, I know many of us feel powerless. Many of us feel like the enemy has already won. But But one last verse, so we can set the record straight in our minds. It's found in Micah, chapter 7, 7 through 10. Look at what it says. As for me, I look to the Lord for his help. Why? Because I'm helpless. I wait confidently for God to save me. Why? Because I cannot save myself. And my God will certainly hear me. Do not gloat over me, my enemies. For though I fall, I will rise again. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord himself will be my light. I will be patient as the Lord punishes me. Now why would he say that? 
because he's humbled and he acknowledges that he's a sinner. He acknowledges that he's morally weak. He acknowledges that he's physically, mentally, in every way weak. I will be patient as the Lord punishes me, for I have sinned against him. But after that, he will take up my case and punish my enemies for all the evil they have done to me. The Lord will bring me out of my darkness into the light, and I will see his righteousness. Then my enemies will see the Lord is on my side. They will be ashamed that they taunted me, saying, Where is the Lord, that God of yours? With my own eyes, I will see them trampled down like mud in the streets. God always wins. Do not be discouraged by what's going on in this world, in this country, in this state, in your life. God always wins. This means that for those that have repented and that have put their faith in Jesus Christ alone, we as a result will win also. In fact, all of you here that are followers of Jesus Christ, you have already won. The battle, the war is over. And this happened because God in His grace, His sovereign grace, He enabled you to be born again. He enabled you to run and turn from your sin and to see Jesus Christ. You acknowledge your weakness to save yourself. And depending, you went and turned and you depended upon Christ's sinless life instead of your own. You've looked to his sacrifice on the cross for the forgiveness of all your sins. You've looked to the empty tomb and seen Jesus Christ risen and seated at the right hand of the Father. The reason God always wins then is this. It's because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the proof of his sovereign power. That's the proof that he always wins. It is his life, his death, his empty tomb. That encapsulates the gospel of Jesus Christ. And some of you right now, you need to win as well. You need to repent. You need to trust in Jesus Christ because without him, you will lose everything. Most notably, your eternal soul to a fiery grave in hell. This is the truth. God always wins and you can win as well. Let's pray together. Father, some folks here this morning, they need to acknowledge, Lord, I am weak. I have sinned. And I need to be brought out of the darkness, my spiritual blindness, and see the light of Christ and see His sinless perfection. See Him high and lifted up, crucified for my sins. See that empty tomb, knowing that He is risen. And so I pray for some that they would cry out to you, pray to you this morning, save me. I put my faith in Christ alone and not myself. And I trust that some will be saved this morning. Others, Father, brothers and sisters in Christ that have assumed too much, that have been living far too long in sin, I pray that they too would confess their sins and rest in your forgiveness. Allow them to embrace whatever discipline that you put upon us, Father, knowing that we belong to you and that you will once again lead us into victory over our sins, Father. We thank you and praise you for your power and that you have already won. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now then, as we take a moment, maybe you need to confess some sins that you're currently living in. Maybe you're blinded to the consequences. I hope this is an, uh, an eye-opener for you. And so if that's the case, take the time before we partake of communion. Confess your sins and rest in knowing that He is good and just forgive you of all your sins. Some of you, you need to uh, share with us, say, hey, I, I got saved today. You come and you let us know. And maybe you want to join this fellowship, be a part of Grace Hill. 
This is your time. This is your opportunity to do that. Whatever God lays upon your heart, you come.